Welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Gerhard Klemek, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Director of the Network for Computational Nanotechnology at Purdue University. Gerhard is also the director of NanoHub, an NSF-funded science and engineering database geared toward education, professional networking, and interactive simulation tools for nanotechnology. Gerhard, to get things started, could you tell us a little bit about how you first got involved in nanotechnology? So I came to the U.S. in 1988 for a one-year adventure to Purdue University. And there I met this faculty member, Supriya Data, in electrical engineering, who was working on quantum electronics, on how to think about electrons at what we today call the nanometer scale. This was 1988. And I decided that I'll work on that for my PhD. And so I stayed and I wrote my PhD thesis on electron electron and electron phonon interactions in quantum transport. That was 94, and I moved on to Dallas, where I worked with the Central Research Lab at Texas Instruments to build modeling tools that would work on the first quantum devices that operated room temperature. And in 98, I moved on to NASA, JPL. So your one-year adventure has turned into 30-plus. Being there at the beginning of the NNI. What are some of your thoughts about how things have changed over the past 15 years? I mean, I've been always on the very real, very applied nano. You have today nano in your pockets, right? Your cell phone, your smartphones are unthinkable without uh, nanoscale transistors. You have now 2 billion transistors on your iPhone chip. And that's a huge number, right? That's a third of the world population working together without a war. I mean, that's how, that's how big that number is. And uh, so, so in that sense, nano is very real. It's very commercial. And it has facets that are outside the semiconductor world uh, that are still rapidly evolving and are very research-based. But the real practicality of nano is here. And it has changed our life, or the life of everybody on this planet, pretty much. So I want to talk to you a little bit about NanoHub. And when we look at the, the goals of the NNI, one of those is focused on research infrastructure. And we look at that quite broadly. We look at that as the physical fabrication and characterization tools, the human infrastructure, so the education workforce development but there's also the cyber component, so the modeling and simulation tools and the, and the shared data. In that context, can you tell folks a little bit about what NanoHub is? Yeah, so NanoHub really has two kinds of services. The core capability uh, is online simulation, and then there are courses, lectures, and tutorials. And these are two very different services. And the online simulation was always very research-based. So Mark Lundstrom started out in 1996 or so to want to share his simulation tools that his group was building here at Purdue with experimental collaborators. And it's a really cool anecdote of a peer of his, an experimental, is giving him a call and saying, do you have a student graduating? And Mark says, yes, but what do you need? Well, I need a piece of software that does this kind of modeling of some specific device. And Mark said, well, we have that software. And then the experimentalist says, well, does it run on Windows? And Mark says, of course not. It runs on Unix. And then the experimentalist says, well, send me the student anyways. I have to re-implement this so it runs on Windows. So it was about transferring research results out of a computational research arena into ex for, uh, use for experimentalists. And that sort of created, in a way, the idea of online simulation and sharing it. And they developed a system to do that. And in um, 2002, NSF began funding it 
as a on a national level um, in an ERC like fashion, uh, some research as a research and infrastructure network. By 2005, we created something that goes beyond web forms, where it was much easier to contribute tools into NanoHub, and users run things as apps. And they run it in the NanoHub cloud. And that was before we even had terms like apps or cloud. So that was not a big deal. So we built our own apps. We built our own cloud, so to speak. And I would claim that NanoHub in that sense is the first scientific end-to-end computing cloud to, to really enable that. And today we have some 18,000 users that run a million simulations. They do that in education and in research. We made it easy that even undergrads that are partnered, say, with grad students can deploy apps in, into our cloud. And then there's a whole other class of users that use over 110 complete courses we have on NanoHub or thousands of lectures. And there is 1.4 million visitors that come to NanoHub. So, so that's 100x more than the simulation users. And, and both of them are global, but the lectures and tutorials are, are much easier to consume as well and also much easier to produce. Going into the different user groups, um, can you talk a little bit how teachers might use NanoHub to incorporate nanotechnology in their classrooms? In terms of educational use, there's really two components. One is we have these uh, recorded lectures uh, we have something called NanoHub U, which has um, uh, collaboration also with edX, uh, where um, faculty members throughout the world and also at Purdue use this material to teach in a flipped classroom. Um, so they, the students watch the video of the lecture, and then there will be recitations or discussions about this material. So that goes as flipped classroom. Um, by, by many people. Um, the, uh, so that's one component, which is relatively easy to, to implement once you have the material. It might be also like a guest lecture or something, say a person needs to be on travel as a faculty member or so. So that integration is, is pretty easy and has a global following. Integration of simulation into formal structured learning is a bit more complex. And many people have tried that in what they call science gateways or portals. And um, I think NanoApp really has created something that is unique in its technology uh, to make this happen. And I think we have some something that really works well. So you have to think of really two classes of scientific software um, that's being created um, for research. Uh, there is software that's built by typically one grad student for one grad student with a usability in mind for one person. And that might be simple scripts, Python, MATLAB. They will study something. They will get a PhD with this. And that stuff can be very useful to others, such as experimentalists. But then there is something bigger that really takes years to develop, like scientific compute, computational engines that would be built, say, at a national lab or at a concerted software effort at a university like what my group has done. And, and those pieces of software are very different from each other, but they have roughly the same challenges. Number one, you need specific computers to run them, like the Windows versus Unix uh, anecdote that I mentioned, you need significant skills to install that stuff in general. And then you have to have the ability to run it once you install it. And um, then it, all of that deployment would have to be scalable to many pieces of software, to many developers and users, so you can engage a whole community. So you have to overcome these four items. And, and NanoHub has done that. So what NanoHub has enabled to do is to encapsulate these complex engines or simple engines and put interfaces on them uh, that they can run inside a browser. And it's, they're easy to use. And you don't have to read a 200-page manual to 
get started. It's just like apps on your phone. You don't read a, a manual for these apps on, on the phones. So so we, we were able to do that. And so it's the hardware, it's the installation of the software, it's the usability of the software. And the fourth item is the scalability of the whole thing. Uh, to, to run this with, um, say, a very small team of people that can run an infrastructure and host it for many people globally and engage the community to, to deploy their content. So Nanolab has developed a, a model and an infrastructure to do that and overcome those four major hurdles. Before I go on, I just want to make a plug also for K-12 teachers because NanoHub is also a repository, and there is a searchable database of resources that have been developed over the lifetime of the NNI through a variety of NSF and other grants that is also available on NanoHub for teachers to find and use in their classrooms. Yeah, there, we, we have material for K-12. through It is developing, and it's being contributed by the community, which is a beautiful thing to see. So looking forward, what are your thoughts about nanotechnology in the future and, and where NanoHub might go to support nanotechnology in the future? So nano as a whole is also very diverse, right? So nano, as I mentioned, is here in, in, in our pockets on the uh, Individual, individual active devices and manufacturing components. I, I see that still growing. In terms of NanoHub, what's the future there? That's, in a way, the, the $3 million question, right? Of We have to find a way that um, we can sustain such an infrastructure. Our NSF funding will run out in four years, so we have to either reinvent NanoHub to a certain degree or we need to find some financial models through grants and maybe use an institution fees. It has been a pretty cool development in the sense that we changed people's perspectives. Like early on, my peers that review us every year told me that you can't use research codes in education. And I had to prove, yes, you can. And they said, well, you have to build your own tools to do research. No, you don't. I mean, if you have reliable tools, then you can reuse them. You don't have to be a tool builder to do research. I mean, other disciplines have built it. Chemistry, for example, right? They have their own codes for years. In nano, they didn't exist. Now they're beginning to be here in electronics and photonics. And there's other areas of nano, like manufacturing and bio, where we're still building such tools. So, so I think that's a pretty cool paradigm shift of changing people's expectations and, and giving them different perspectives of what's possible. And, and NanoHub has become a publisher. We are publishing tools, and the Web of Science approached us a couple of years ago and said, we want to list your tools in the Web of Science. And we worked with them to make that possible. And once that was working, Google Scholar followed suit. And we're listed in Google Scholar now as a publisher of a new class of publications, tools, which is pretty cool, I think. I think it's pretty cool as well. And you mentioned a paradigm shift. And I think that a real national resource or international resource, but certainly one that we see as being an important part of goal three or the, the research infrastructure to support the community. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners? I'd like to share that we worked on culture change, right? We changed expectations. It takes a while for that to settle in and we'll hopefully do more of that in the next few years and, and really develop NanoHub as a platform that is um, sustainable through a variety of funding. So I think we are of use to many people and we need to uh, find a way to, to sustain that. Thank you for joining us today for Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us 
at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories.